so uh, the saintly aspect of this, uh, this, this chapter is called Saints in the Age of Electronic Stained Glass, is that the cult of the, uh, the phenomenology of the cult of the celebrity is very much analogous to uh, the ancient phenomenon of the medieval saint. Um, the cult of the saints is something that began to take off in the 4th century AD, about the time of Augustine. And uh, the saints were basically individuals, miracle-working individuals who displaced and replaced uh, the miracle-working capacities of the pagan gods who had disappeared from the world, and the saints came in. And there were two structures associated with Christianity, the basilica, which became the basis of the church. Originally that had been the Roman meeting house, and the martyria. The martyria were these weird structures that were set up in, in Roman cemeteries that were devoted to the death of a particular Christian uh, a, a martyr. That's why they were called martyria. And um, inside them, then, this person would become divinized and deified uh, and, and turned into this uh, saintly individual. And then people would go, and there was a whole cult of relics. They would, they would lust after little splinters or bits of clothing or, or pieces that became relics that might have healing powers or salvific powers. And then people also would name their children after these individuals, which is one of the reasons why uh, people are named after these early apostles and Christian uh, martyrs and saints. And I think that uh, what is going on today in the cult and phenomenology of the, uh, the celebrity, the light speed celebrity, is something that's analogous to this. There is a kind of religious aura that glows about them now. Uh, people have named their children after uh, figures like James Dean and Princess Diana and Elvis Presley. There was a boom in, in people naming their children after these individuals. And it has been said, as Camille Paglia points out, that Elvis Presley uh, is more or less the first Protestant saint. And analogous to this martyria, uh, the Graceland is somewhat, it was basically uh, put, Elvis's body was moved from the cemetery to the house, apparently by his father, uh, thus making it directly analogous to these martyria. And it became a kind of uh, a shrine to the, the first Protestant saint. So there is a, there's a religious aura about these individuals, and I think that part of the reason why they have become the platonic archetypes by way of which all others who aspire to fame in this culture now model themselves. Half of the actors in Hollywood, as Camille Paglia points out, are modeled after either uh, are modeled after uh, either James Dean or Marlon Brando, and, and you'll see like Billy Zane and Hayden Christensen. A lot of them do resemble Marlon Brando, and the other half tend to resemble James Dean, the blondes, Robert Redford, and and so forth. So those tend to be the two archetypes for male actors, just as Marilyn Monroe tends to be one of the main basic archetypes for female actors, uh, Marilyn Monroe and Elizabeth Taylor. Um, I didn't write about Elizabeth Taylor in the book because she was still alive at the time I wrote the book, uh, but there's a chapter in it on Marilyn Monroe. So they've become the platonic archetypes by means of which others have measured themselves, uh, usually not very well. But they, they are the ones that, that modern individuals who attain to fame aspire to become. They model themselves after. And this is mostly a post-World War II development. It's something that really took off in the 1950s with the rise of consumer, the worldless society that we're living in now, which is based on a, a consumer civilization of interstate highways, shopping malls, which were erected at the exit and entrance ramps to these freeways to this day, fast food restaurants, uh, and a world of electronic images that replicate, um, that replicate and create two-dimensional avatars and doppelgangers uh, that flatten and crush out the three-dimensional personality. So these individuals in the 1950s, Marlon Brando and Elizabeth Taylor, um, and then uh, other figures like James Dean and Elvis Presley, went through this process of having their images replicated either on screen, in the case of James Dean, or uh, in the case of Elvis Presley on television. It was really television that made Elvis Presley into a, a massive phenomenon. And those images uh, that are propagated at the speed of light instantly, and especially via television through, uh, they're democratized and, and sent into everyone's houses, um, propagates these images, and they become image clones, these two-dimensional avatars. But the problem is that for the celebrity, the creation of these images becomes a problem. It becomes an agon because these images are very much like mythic archetypes in that they are simplifications of the individual. They're, they're like caricatures. They flatten out the complete personality into a quick, rough sketch so that everything can be in captured in a glimpse. We think of Marilyn Monroe as the ditzy blonde uh, who loved uh, men's attention, had no brain, and there's nothing else really to think about. She is it, the Venus of the megalopolis, and that's all there is to her. But in fact, in reality, as, as we well know, but as most people tend to forget, 
who fall in love with these images, uh, these people were three-dimensional individuals with three-dimensional personalities as real and complicated uh, and riven with suffering as yours and mine. And they suffered the problem of what to do once these images had captured these avatars that they generated, had captured them and forced them to fit into these molds. Marilyn Monroe spent her life battling against that image avatar and she undertook a number of film roles to try to deconstruct it in movies like Bus Stop and uh, the last film she did, Misfits, where she tried to deconstruct that image of the ditzy blonde, but no one ever really bought the deconstruction. They wanted the, the image that appears again in Some Like It Hot later on in her career of the ditzy blonde, who's an absolute knockout that every man wants to sleep with. Um, that's that's what we think of as her, and nobody's interested in the fact that the real Marilyn Monroe read Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and liked poetry and literature and novels and spent most of her time being alone. Uh, she very much liked, uh, you know, lived like kind of like a writer or a literate person. That, that's the, just the way she was. Um, so there's a disconnect there. And the same thing happened with Elvis Presley. Once he had generated this image of the, the Dionysus of the suburbs, uh, the wild, dangerous, uh, revolving-hipped Dionysus of the suburbs. Nobody wanted it to know anything else about him. And later in life, when he started to become, uh, he, it turns out that he did have half a brain, and he became a voracious reader, especially books on spirituality. He read tons of New Age classics and books about spirituality. But his behavior, you know, it, it, it puzzled his paid circle of friends and admirers, and uh, especially his agent, Colonel Tom Parker, who was, who was in charge of managing his image archetype, not the real Elvis, the image archetype. And this real Elvis began to create cognitive dissonance that messed up that image. And so he put a lot of pressure on Elvis, and so did his friends, to stop this nonsense of being literate and sitting around reading books. It's inconsistent with his public avatar. So he caved, uh, much to his discredit, he caved in, held a book-burning rally, burned all his spirituality books and stopped reading them. And that's really a shame. But that is what happens. That is the kind of add-on that, that this experiment that we have been undertaking as a civilization since World War II of descending the human being, dipping him like Han Solo in Empire Strikes Back into the carbonite, dipping him into the electronic plasma pool. Uh, that's the experiment that, that's going on and that we're still working out to this day. And in many respects, the celebrities were the pioneers of this media that uh, I'm using right now with YouTube and that uh, the average person can use on Facebook and YouTube to make themselves famous, or, or at least many celebrities, uh, you know, for no particular reason whatsoever. All you have to do now, as Andy Warhol proved, is just step in front of a camera, and you can become famous for nothing, for no reason whatsoever, other than the fact that your image is being electronically replicated and shot around the earth at the speed of light. So that's the cult and culture and the phenomenology of the celebrity that I deal with in the introduction to the book. And then I move into the first chapter. So the first chapter, which is what I want to discuss in this uh, sequence, is on Howard Hughes. Now, uh, this is uh, a phenomenology that I see having emerged in uh, ever since World War II. But there are forerunners to it uh, that began to get started in the 30s when cinema began to develop and move into a larger uh, mass medium, especially with sound added to it. Rudolph Valentino was a forerunner of this. Uh, but also individuals like Howard Hughes and Walt Disney were precursors. Howard Hughes attained a fame in the 1930s. Walt Disney really in the 1950s, although his Mickey Mouse cartoons made his image avatar, in that case Mickey Mouse, famous in the 30s. Um, so these individuals I see as sort of forerunners of this later descent of these individuals like Elvis and James Dean and Marilyn as the classic exemplars. They're the forerunners. They're the sort of John the Baptist figures before we get the real thing with the Christ phenomenon. Um, so I, I, wanted to, I, I start out by discussing, uh, discussing Howard Hughes and uh, Walt Disney. So it's to Howard Hughes that I want to move the discussion now. And one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, write a chapter about Howard Hughes was because in reading the, the writings of the French philosopher Paul Virilio, uh, I noticed that he has a number of passages, especially in his interview books, where he talks about the phenomenology of Howard Hughes. And what fascinated him, Howard Hughes was somebody I'd never just vaguely, dimly knew about. I'd seen Martin Scorsese's movie, The Aviator. But other than that, knew very little about. Uh, but Virilio talked about what fascinated him about Howard Hughes was how the first half of his life was devoted to motion. And he built and designed all these airplanes, and you got this man who accelerated himself physically around the planet through all of these technological innovations with airplanes. But then in the second half of his life, due to drug addiction and the pain uh, from his various crashes and accidents, he was immobilized. And so he shifted from utter freedom of movement around the planet in the first half of his life 
to a state of total stasis and immobility in the second half of his life. And that fascinated me, so I decided to read a couple of biographies about Howard Hughes and to study and think about him. And so what I've done is, in the chapter I've presented his life in two halves. The first half uh, I've called A Sense Sublime, and the second half The Azimuth of Descent. Now if you watch Martin Scorsese's wonderful film The Aviator, uh, he only gives you that first half. He ends the film with the uh, with triumph of Hughes's flight of the world's largest airplane still to this day, the Hercules, the Spruce Goose, uh, with him getting that off the ground above the water off of uh, the shores of Long Beach uh, in, um, I've forgotten the year now, but uh, he got it up uh, 47, 1947, and the film ends there, uh, and it's too bad because it misses the irony of the, and the poetry of the second half of Hughes's life, which I want to go into here. Now, the interesting thing about Hughes, and Hughes and Disney, and the way in which they differ from the other celebrities that I've talked about in the book is that they are the creators of the stage, the proscenium upon which the drama of the tragic dying and reviving celebrity is enacted. They, they are the creators of the, the framework, the world framework, um, especially Howard Hughes, who, if you know, we could make the rash statement, if we were to make the rash statement that um, one man is the creator of this consumer modern society that we're living in, uh, Howard Hughes would be the closest individual that we could come to to point to and say that it's largely his creation and that we're living in the world envisioned by Howard Hughes. Um, Howard Hughes was born in 1905, and he died in 1976, uh, and he attained to fame in the 1930s. First, with, in 1935, he broke a speed record by designing a brand new type of plane, which he called the Silver Bullet. It was also known as the H-1 Racer. This was in 1935, and it's a sleek science fiction looking thing. It's very smooth. The rivets, for the first time, were set flush so that there was an aerodynamic nature to this plane that was utterly unrivaled. And it was the first plane to have retractable landing gear, uh, as though Hughes sensed uh, the truth of McLuhan's uh, insight that the airplane renders the wheel obsolete. And there was a small cockpit that was designed basically for one individual and a very powerful engine. And so uh, this was in uh, Glendale, California. Uh, and uh, Hughes had his men design and build the world's fastest plane. And then he took off and flew it in 1935, and he set the record, the world record, for the fastest air flight. Uh, there had been a record before that, uh, that the fastest flight was, I think, 314 miles per hour. But he set a new uh, flying record for 352 miles per hour with this famous flight. And he ended up crashing at the end of the flight, but he wasn't seriously injured. And this was not the first of his crashes. The other thing about Howard Hughes that's interesting is that he... He really constitutes the world's first serial crash artist. He was in five major plane crashes, unbelievably, and also a string of automobile accidents, in one of which he actually killed a guy in a hit-and-run accident, uh, but he was able to buy his way out of that. Uh, so there, there's a strange inner self-destructive nature to this man, um, and he's mechanizing and growing wings, and he's obsessed with flying and getting away from the earth and conquering it and overmastering it, by encircling it. And so, in the first uh, famous flight, we have him setting this record. Then the next famous flight that he undertook in 1938 was a Lockheed uh, 14, uh, Model 14 twin-engine airplane that he flew around the world from New York uh, to Paris, to Siberia, to Alaska, to Minneapolis, and then back to New York. Made a complete circumnavigation of the globe and breaking again another world record for doing it in only three days. Uh, I think the previous world record had been set in the 30s by Wiley Post, who took eight days uh, flying around the, the globe um, on his own, but Hughes did it here in three days. Uh, three days and 19 hours, something like that, almost four days. Uh, but he broke the record and, and it, 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 he became very famous as the result of this. Also at about this time, pr prior to these flights, Hughes had uh, made a number of movies, silent films and movies, and he had already established a certain amount of fame for himself as a, as a great director and producer. His film Hell's Angels, uh, Martin Scorsese sh shows him making it, he had cast Jean Harlow in it. Jean Harlow is a kind of forerunner of uh, Marilyn Monroe. He had cast her in it, and uh, this is a, one, it was one of the first talkies in uh, 20, 1927 or 28. And that's a wonderful film that's set during World War I and has some of the best scenes still to this day, I think, showing air flights against dirigibles, uh, against wonderful blimps, not blimps, but uh, airships, uh, some of the best scenes I've ever seen. 
So the film is worth worth watching uh, just for that. Um, 